Welcome to the robotics class for February the 16th. I'm recording this because there are a couple of you who aren't here. And uh, what we're going to be talking about today is pretty important. Uh, and for many of you, it'll be brand new. So uh, you might want to go back and take a look at it a second time. Uh, all right. So first off, let me ask, how did things go uh, with the relay circuit? Uh, in fact, I tell you what, let me, let me just remind you what we did last time, just in case you forgot. So uh, I'll, I'll share my canvas with you. All right. And so if we go into modules, then it takes us down to the assignment that we started talking about last time. So that's the midterm exam. All right. That would, and now it's, it's not due until this coming Saturday night. But uh, we talked about it last time so that you could get a start on it because it's kind of complex. There's 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 a couple things that uh, needed to do. Hang on a sec here. Somebody just got here. Let me let me let him in. Party. All right. OK, so hopefully you recall that uh, there are two circuits that are uh, that you need to make in order to get a good score on the on the midterm exam here. Uh, so last time we only talked about the one on the right. That was the relay circuit. I briefly mentioned the one on the left which uses the H bridge, but only briefly. Somebody else just got here. Let me let her in. Or a lot of people tardy today. Okay. All right, so last time I briefly mentioned the circuit on the left, but only briefly. So what I asked you guys to do last time was to start working on the circuit on the right. So here's my, oh, I, let's see, let me, I'm not, sometimes the this, this share doesn't work very well. Let me get out of here. And, okay, so you should be looking at the Tinkercad right now. And if I zoom in a bit on the one on the right here. Okay, so this is the circuit that I suggested that you should start making over the weekend, even though it's not due today. So if you didn't do it over the weekend, it's not the end of the world. But uh, I, you, you are going to need to make this before Saturday night. And it would be helpful if you had uh, already made it. So let me, let me ask right now, let me pause for just a second here and ask, uh, please type into the chat box in a private message saying, yes, if you successfully made the circuit, and type no if you have not yet done it. And remember, I'm not talking about a Tinkercad version of the circuit. I'm talking about the real circuit. All right, so I'm seeing uh, pretty much even numbers of yeses and nos. Um, yeah, yeah, Simon, I heard, and that's OK. So uh, we can deal with that. All right, so uh, the latest uh, results that just came in, I'm definitely seeing more nos than yeses now. Uh, and one person is telling me that they tried, but they weren't successful. Uh, now, I don't want to embarrass that one person. So let me just ask that one person, if you would like to talk about what you did, maybe we could work together to figure out why you weren't successful. But if you'd prefer not to do that, I'm OK with that. So so let, type into the chat box again. I'm speaking to the one person who, who uh, told me they weren't successful. Give me another message in the chat box letting me know. So yes means yes, you're willing to talk about it? Yeah. OK. All right, so uh, go ahead and tell us what happened and what kind of problems did you run into? Um. So first of all, my motor, the wire broke off, so I need to get that resoldered. Um, and also, uh, I think I wired it up wrong, uh, the circuit, because uh, it wouldn't work. But I tested the voltage and um i found that the at least the code was working because the um, it would go on for like three seconds and off like the voltage so yeah mm -hmm. but like when i the relay switch it wouldn't like turn on the motor so okay well yeah if the motor's not wired up that that would explain it um so i'm glad you mentioned something about the, the motor with the lead on the motor breaking off this is something that you guys all need to know okay so I, I hope that you can see right now. Let's see, have I got everything set? Okay, so hopefully you can see me large now. 
So this is a motor where the lead has broken off. These leads are very, very fragile. Uh, and also the soldering, sometimes the soldering comes undone. So, so if the wire uh, isn't connected, uh, if it's because of the soldering joint, you can just re-solder the joint on. But sometimes the little tab that the, uh, the, the uh, wire connects to, sometimes that thing breaks off. They are really, really cheap. That is the reason why I gave everybody a spare motor. Uh, and I don't remember what I did with my spare motor here. Well, I had a spare motor sitting here and now I can't find it anymore. But anyway, let me show you. Oh, here it is. Here's, here's the spare motor. Okay, so, so everybody has two of these red, or um, red, yeah. Two, everybody has two of these yellow motors. And you have one of these. Now notice this is not the baby motor that I'm talking about. You know, the baby motor is uh, shorter, okay? This motor right here, uh, this is maybe kind of a, a teenager motor perhaps, say. So this is the motor that goes in here. This is actually, there's, there's a motor here and then there's a gearbox. So if you have broken off the lead, uh, and, and there's no tab left, so you can't solder it back on. What you need to do is you need to replace the motor with the replacement. Watch carefully, I'm going to show you how to replace a motor. Okay. So there is a, a clear plastic strip that is, holds the motor in place. And right here, there, there's a, a notch from the yellow plastic uh, gear case that, that hooks into a, a, uh, a um, open space on the uh, clear plastic uh, holder. So what you need to do is, is you just need to pull that down and it'll pop off. Now it's on really tight, so pulling it down is easier said than done. If you have a pair of needle nose pliers, the job is really easy. If you don't have a pair of needle nose pliers, it can be really tough and you might damage this clear yellow strip. So let me show you the way that it works. I'm going to take the, the needle nose pliers. I'm going to put them in here. Okay, so you see how I'm holding onto the clear plastic thing? Okay, so what I'm going to do then, now that I've got that, I'm going to grip it really good and securely. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to pull down. And when it, when it uh, releases, then I'm going to pop it up. So I'm, I'm going to hold my thumb down here. So, so I'm going to pull down and you got to pull pretty hard. But if you do it right, you can pull it off without ripping. Now, if you're not careful, it will rip. Uh, I was able to do this a couple times before. There we go. Okay, there. Okay, that was kind of tricky, but I got it. So can you see now that uh, the tab is no longer uh, hooked on, on this little yellow hook here. So now I can just lift this up and, uh, and off it comes. And so now, now what I can do is I can, I can just grab the motor and wiggle it a little bit and it'll come right out, okay? Now, notice the motor that came out is a little different than the motor that I gave you. You see it's got that little plastic gear on it. So this plastic gear has to mesh with some other plastic gears that are inside here. Right? So what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to take the plastic gear off of this one and put it onto the new one. Now that is also easier said than done. If you just grab it with your fingers and pull, uh, in theory, you it could work, but it uh, it's it's a little bit hard to get. So what you could do is you could get a cloth and wiggle it, or what I, what I would recommend is again take your needle nose pliers and just kind of, or or actually get a screwdriver. That's a better job. Let me get a screwdriver. There's all my screwdrivers. Okay. 
All right, so if you get a flat head screwdriver and you put it in here and just kind of wiggle it like that, kind of nudge it up. You know, I don't know if you can tell, but I've, I've lifted that gear up quite a bit now. So I should now be able to just grab it with my hand and pull it off. Yep, she came off really nice and easy there. Okay, and so then put that on the new motor and just push it down. And then, uh, and then once you have it on the new motor, okay, so put, push. So before you take it off, note uh, how far it sticks out because you want it to stick out the same amount when you put it on. Okay, so, so get it right there. Get the same thing. And then take this, take the new motor and just put it inside and you don't, don't worry about putting it in the wrong way. There is no really wrong way. And, and so just put it back in here push it down until it's all the way down, okay? And, and what I like to do just to make sure that it meshes right is I would say grab a hold of the, uh, the white tab here and give it a little bit of a spin and verify that it spins okay. There should be, a, it'll be a, there'll be a lot of resistance, but it'll be, it'll be good enough. Now take, take this clear thing and th so there's a tab on each side, so put it, put it on the tab on the one side, that'll be easy. And then put it up over the top. And now you need to get it to lock onto the tab down here. You're going to have to pull down again. So get out the needle nose pliers again and grab onto this thing. And then just, now it usually goes on a lot easier than it comes off. But of course now it's not gonna do it that way. Never does it when people are watching. Yep, yeah, it's gonna be a little. Tr this is this is the tricky part here, is doing this without tearing the thing. There we go. Okay, got it. Okay. Okay, so it's now locked on. Okay, and so uh, so that's the deal. So you guys may need to do that. If you don't have a pair of needle nose pliers. I'd recommend you get some. I mean, these are wonderful tools. Uh, everybody should have a pair of needle nose pliers in your house. And also another thing that you're gonna find will come in really handy. When, if, if you need to go to the, to the store to buy your set of needle nose pliers, while you're there, I would also highly recommend that you get a really small Phillips screwdriver. Let me show you what I mean by that. Okay, there's these things here that are called precision screwdrivers, or sometimes they're called jeweler screwdrivers. So, and they're not very expensive. I mean, you can get for five bucks, like five, five to 10 bucks. All right, so this gives you a whole set of different ones. Some of these are flat, some of these are, are Phillips. Uh, here's another version that uh, you can get. It's got a, a little uh, a driver handle, and then it's got a whole bunch of different bits that you can put in there. And this one, Boy, this has a ton of them. It's got flat and it's got Phillips and it's also got Torx and it's got a bunch of other heads as well. This is a really good one to get, but uh, you're going to need it later. Uh, there's there's a few parts in your kit, uh, in your kit of parts, where in order to uh, do them, to uh, work them properly, you're going to need a very, very small Phillips screwdriver. And it has to be Phillips. You know, Phillips is, you know, the plus and the minus. Some some screwdrivers like this one here. This is what we call them. This is a, what's called a flathead. Uh, whereas a Phillips screwdriver is like this one. Okay, I don't know how well this is going to show up on the camera. So this one, this one here, is like a plus sign. This one here is like a minus sign. All right, so this is the Phillips, this is the flathead. Now these are these are normal size screwdrivers and they are not gonna work for the thing that you need. You are gonna need to have a really small precision jewelers one. Um, and the reason that you're gonna need it is that one of the parts that you will be using, 
is this guy right here. Okay. The way that you attach the wires to this is there are some holes right here and you, you take a jeweler screwdriver and you stick it in the holes. We'll, we'll talk more about it later, but basically you use a jeweler screwdriver to open up the, uh, the, uh, the opening so you can stick the wire in and then you use the jeweler screwdriver to close it up again so it grips onto the, onto the wire. Uh, we're not going to do that this week, but probably next week we're going to start into that. So if you don't already have a, a set of jewelers, screwdrivers or precision screwdrivers, I highly recommend you get one and uh, a pair of needle nose pliers. Highly recommend you get those. Okay. So Eric, uh, if you want, if you, if you, if you have a soldering iron and you, and you think it's worth trying to solder the wire back onto the motor, go for it. But otherwise, just swap it out for the uh, for the other, that spare motor that I gave you. Okay. Uh, okay. So now most of the rest of you said you did not do it. So let's just remind you of what you're going to need to do, and let me also remind you that that this is going to be due this coming Saturday. So I strongly recommend that you be that be between now and Thursday, you guys try this out because. I expect that you may have some problems. And so if you've tried it before Thursday, then on Thursday, we can talk about it. And uh, hopefully we can work out the solutions to any problems. Okay, so this is the one where we've got a relay. And let me just remind you really quickly what we talked about last time. So the Arduino controls the, uh, the relay. So we got a line right here from the Arduino and it comes into this pin and this turns on the electromagnet and then the electricity comes back here and it flows back here to the Arduino. So the electricity is flowing like this. When, when you turn on whatever pin that is attached to, electricity flows through the relay. Notice that this electricity does not power the motor because the motor requires more, pow more power than the Arduino can put out. All the Arduino is doing is turning on the electromagnet, okay? And then when the electromagnet is turned on, then the electricity from the big battery can come into the relay and then it comes out here and then it goes and it goes through the motor and the motor turns and then it goes back to the battery. But it only does that when the Arduino has turned on the electromagnet, okay? So this then can be used with any battery. Right here, we've got three double A's, so that's 4.5 volts. But you could use a much bigger battery. You could take a, like a car battery, a 12 volt car battery. And you could hook this up to a really big motor, you know, like, like this motor right here. This, this is a 12 volt motor. And uh, so it requires a big, strong battery and it pulls a lot of current. So you could do this using this exact same relay that we've got right here. This relay, it can handle, it can easily handle 12 volts, uh, no problem at all. In fact, it could go even more. If, if we zoom in on it, let me, let me clear this and zoom in on it. Okay, you see here what's written on the uh, relay, okay. DC five volts, that's just the electromagnet. Okay, so five volts is perfect because that's what the Arduino puts out. All right, so the, the five volts there, that tells you what it needs to turn on the electromagnet. This other stuff down here, this tells you what can flow through the rest of the circuit. And you can see it can go all the way up to 125 volts of AC current, okay? And it can put out one amp. And by the way, one amp, we haven't talked about amps. Maybe this is a good minute to talk about amps. An amp is a measure of how much electricity is flowing. Remember that a volt is not a measure of how much electricity is flowing. A volt is a measure of how much electrical pressure is pushing the electricity through there. 
But if there's no if, if there's no path for it to go, then you've got all this pressure, but no electricity is flowing. So if you do have a path, but the path has a lot of resistance in it, then only a little bit of electricity will be flowing. Even though the pressure can be very high, only a little bit of electricity is actually flowing. So an amp is a measure of how much electricity is flowing. These little yellow motors, they take about one amp, which means that uh, this relay that we've got right here, if we look at the, what's written on it, okay, you'll see that the maximum current that they recommend that you put through this relay is one amp if you're at 125 volts, okay? But if you're at a lower voltage, then it can take more. So at, at 30, if you have a, if you were to hook this up to a 30 volt battery, you could push two amps through this resistor or through this, uh, through this relay and it'd be fine. And in fact, now I'm not gonna go into the math here because this is more of what we talk about in my electronics class. But if you were to use a 15 volt battery, then you could push four amps through here. Okay, and so we're going to be using a, a, a five volt battery. So we, we could actually put uh, 12 amps through this thing. If we, if, if we have a five volt uh, battery, then this thing could handle 12 amps, which is 12 times more than we, we actually need because this motor right here uses like one amp. This bigger motor right here, he depending on depending on uh, how much load, uh, how much resistance we put on it, this thing could put up to thirty or forty amps, uh, which which is really a lot. But this little guy right here, he's about one amp, so you're okay. Okay, so uh, so your job, at least the first part of the, the of the midterm exam here is just to hook this up. And I've got the Arduino program so that when we start the simulation, uh, you'll see, okay, so it, you can see on the voltmeter now that we're getting 4.2 amps. And if you look at the motor, you'll see the motor's turning. Now all of a sudden we're at zero and the motor has stopped. And then after a few seconds, it should go back up high again. Now there, okay, so it's back up high again and you'll see the motor is now running again. All right, so the motor is, is, is going for three seconds and it stopped for three seconds and going for three seconds and stops three, for three seconds, okay? So you just need to make a circuit that does that. All right, so what I'd like you to do now in the chat box is I want you to type in either yes or no. Yes means that you're confident that you could go ahead and build this circuit. No means that you still have some questions. I want everybody to type it in and you can type it in privately if you want. All right, so all I'm seeing are yeses. Oh, I'm seeing one person says yes, I think. Okay, I'll take that for a yes. Okay, so now let's move on to the new stuff. This is the second half of the assignment, which is due this coming Saturday. Okay, so the second half of the assignment is to do this. Okay, this guy over here, let me stop the simulation. This guy over here is very similar to what we just did, except this component right here is not a, a normal mechanical relay. This guy is a solid state relay. Okay. Solid state means that it doesn't have any moving parts. And so that means that it's okay to pulse with modulate this guy. So uh, speaking of which, before I go any further, let me let me turn back on these uh, these little notes that I've got right here. Okay, pay attention to these notes. Okay, when you when you make this circuit here, do not pulse with modulate it. Okay, never pulse with modulate a mechanical relay you will destroy the relay, okay? The inside the relay, you've got that moving part and that thing is rated for, you know, tens of thousands of cycles before it breaks. 
But if you pulse width modulate it, you could, e you could easily get 10,000 cycles in one minute and you'll break the relay. But on the left side over here, this is a solid state relay. It doesn't have any moving parts in it. So you can pulse width modulate this thing all day long and it will not cause any problems at all. So it's a solid state relay, but it's more than just a relay. This is a special kind of a relay called an H-bridge. Okay, so this is a solid state H-bridge. It would help if I could spell bridge right. Okay, so what is an H-bridge? Well, anybody know? I bet Zane knows. Zane, do you know what an H-bridge is? Oh, sorry, wrong button, but yeah. Um, it has four um, transistors to let the current flow in different ways. Okay, all right, good. So let me draw a picture of what he just said. Uh, so imagine that you've got four relays and you've got a motor and you want to run this motor. So here is how you could do it. So here's the motor. So a circle with an M in it, and I'm gonna call it a motor. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take these relays. Now I'm just gonna show them as if they're regular switches, right? So here's my big battery. This is where I'm going to get the power to run my, my uh, motor. So I've got a plus side and I've got a minus side. So I'm going to take the plus side and I'm going to run it down here. But here I'm going to put it through a switch. So this is going to be a relay. It's an electronically, electrically operated switch, but it's basically just a switch. Okay, so I'm going to run it in here and it comes to the motor here. And then I'm going to run it out here. And now I'm going to put a switch here. Now you might wonder why, but you're going to find out in just a minute. Okay. So then it comes down to here and then it goes back to the ba big battery. So if I want to turn on the motor, what I can do is just close this switch and close this switch and then the motor will run. Okay. But what if I want to run the motor in reverse? Okay. Well, if you want to run a motor in the reverse, all you have to do is just switch the wires. I can do that. What I'll do is I'll take my battery and I'll run another line over here. So these two are connected together and I'm going to hook it up through a different switch right here. And then I'm going to hook up another switch right here. So I'm going to call this guy here switch A. This is switch B. This is switch C and this is switch D. So I want you to look and see what happens. What we did before was we, we turned on uh, A and B. No, no, A and D is what we had on before. So if A and D are on, and if B and C are off, then, so, so on means closed, right? So this would correspond to, I've got this guy closed and I've got this guy closed. So that means the electricity is gonna come in here. It's gonna flow through here. It's gonna flow through the battery that way, flow down here, flow here, here, and it's gonna come up and it's gonna go back in the battery. And so the motor is going to turn clockwise. Notice that because this is open and this is open, electricity can't flow through there. The only way electricity can flow is this way here, and that'll make the motor turn clockwise. What if I want to make the motor run counterclockwise? What do I do then? Well, what I do is instead of having these guys the way they were, I turn these guys off, and these guys here that used to be off, I turn them on, All right? So let's make these guys be off. 
and let's make these guys be on. So I close that switch and I close that switch. Now you can see what's going to happen. The electricity wants to flow through here, but it can't because this switch is open. So it can't go that way. So the electricity is going to come here, go through there. Now the electricity would like to go through here to get back to the battery, but it can't because this is open. So it can't go that way. So the electricity is going to flow through the motor in the opposite direction of the, what it was going before. So instead of mo the motor turning this way, the motor is going to turn the opposite direction. The electricity is going to come through here, bingo, right? So, so what we have now is a very clever arrangement that makes it so we can run the motor forwards or backwards without having to actually unplug the wires and swap the wires. We can leave the wires connected all the time and just by, by choosing which relays we open and which way relays we closed, we can make it so the electricity either goes through the, through the motor this way, or we can make it so the electricity goes through the motor the other way. And you can see, hopefully, by looking at the picture, why it's called an H-bridge. If you look at this part right here, where the relays are connected to the motor, you can see it makes the letter H. So we call it an H-bridge. Does that make sense, everybody? So give me a give me a yes in the chat box if that makes sense. Give me a no if that doesn't make sense. I need to hear from everybody here. All right, I'm hearing from most everybody. What about the rest of you? Are you guys asleep? Do you want me to name names? Okay, I want everybody to type into the chat box here. I need to know you're all awake. Catherine, are you awake? Okay, Zane, I'm glad. Okay, good. All right. Okay, good. All right. So an H bridge could be made out of mechanical relays where you have moving parts, or it could be made out of solid state relays where you don't have moving parts. It's obviously best to make it out of mechanical or make it out of solid state relays, because if you make it out of solid state relays, then you can use pulse width modulation and you can make it so that instead of just running the motor at full speed or zero, you can make it run at quarter speed or 63.2% speed, whatever, whatever you want. All right, so let's go back to this baby right here. This circuit, this, this component that you see right here, this is a solid state H bridge. And the way that uh, the way that you can make it work is if if you apply the signals in the right way, then it will make it so that the electricity will th will throw flow through the motor from the green. It'll flow through the motor this way, but depending on how you do the signals, you could make it so that the electricity will flow the opposite way, and so that will make the motor run forwards or make the motor motor run backwards. Okay, so how do we connect it up? All right, well, if you zoom in on, on the, this guy right here, if you hover over these inputs, you can see it'll tell you what all the different inputs are. But it's a little bit hard to see it that way. So what I've done is if we go back here to the, uh, if we go back here to the assignment here, you'll see that I have given you a uh, diagram of showing uh, how the chip needs to be connected. Um, if you look at the chip here, sorry, hang on a sec. Every time I, I change things, I have to turn annotation on and off and it gets really annoying. All right, each leg of the, the little Caterpillar chip has a number. This chip has 16 legs and they're all numbered. This is leg number one and then two, three, four, so forth. And then it goes around this way and this one's number 16. Now, if you, if you look at the chip up close, 
you'll see there's a little half circle right here. And that half circle is there so that you know which, which leg is pin one and which leg is 16. So leg, leg, uh, leg one and leg 16, those are the ones that are on the side that has the half circle on it. Now on the chips that I gave you guys, I also put a paint dot on it. Um, and the reason I put a paint dot on it is just to help me sort out the chips because there's a whole bunch of chips that all look the same. If you look right here, I've got two chips right here that look exactly identical, but they are not. One of these is an H bridge and one of these is a chip that does something totally different. Now, the way that you normally do it is you, there's a little number on the chip there. And if you look up that number, it'll tell you what it is. But it's easier for me as a teacher to be able to tell at a glance, uh, but just by putting paint dots on it. So I put silver, I put a silver paint dot on my chips that are H bridges. And I put blue dots or your yellow dots or orange dots or whatever, depending on whatever else they are. So when you look at yours and you see that little silver dot, be aware that they don't come from the factory with that silver dot on there. That's something that I put on there just to help me sort it out. Okay, I see somebody's got their, their mic on. So I think maybe I'll just mute everybody here. Okay. Okay. All right, good. All right. Okay. So if you can, if you can look for that little half dimple there, that little half circle, then pin number one is a pin that needs to be connected up. Uh, well, okay. Actually, this, you know, you know, come to think of it, this drawing that I've got here is not really the best drawing. Um, after class is over, I'm going to find a better drawing. Pin number one is the pin that's called enable. Uh, if you have uh, five volts on pin number one, then everything on this side of the H bridge is turned on, it's activated. Um, and if this, if you don't have five volts here, then everything on this side of the H bridge is just turned off. And in a minute, I'll explain why that's actually a very good thing. But uh, for, I won't worry about it for right now. Um, pin number two, this is the control input. This is where you get a signal from the Arduino. And, it, and this can be a very weak signal it's not going it, to, it doesn't require really any current. If, if I turn on pin number two, what it will do then is it will turn on pin number three. Pin number two and pin number three are connected together in such a way that if I, if I put a, a weak voltage on pin number two, then this chip will put a strong voltage on pin number three. And that is the voltage that is going to go to the motor and, and it's going to pass through the motor and it's going to make the motor run clockwise. And then it's going to come into pin number six, but it'll only come into pin number six if control input number two is set low. So I'm going to talk about high and low. When I say high, what I mean is there's five volts on that pin. When I say low, that means that there's zero volts on the pin, which is also called ground. Okay, so if you want the motor to run in, in the forward direction, then what you do is you, you will set pin number two to be high, and you'll set pin number three to be low. And these come from the Arduino. So from Arduino. Okay, now the motor does not get its power from the Arduino. The motor gets its power from somewhere else. And that somewhere else is pin number eight. Pin number eight is hooked up to the big battery. Now in the drawing here, 
they said 12 volts, but it doesn't have to be 12 volts. This is just the plus terminal on the big battery. And when I say big, I just mean the one that supplies a lot of power. So it could be a 12 volt battery, but it doesn't have to be 12 volts. It could be six volts, it could be nine volts, could be five volts, doesn't matter. Okay. So this is where the, the motor is actually gonna get the power from. So if we set, up, set things up the way that I've described here, so that pin number two is high and pin number seven is low, then this chip is going to make it so that pin number three mirrors whatever pin number two is, except it gets its power from the big battery. So, so then pin number three is gonna be at 12 volts and pin number seven, okay, that determines what pin number six is gonna look like. So if I put pin number seven low, then pin number six is gonna be low, but it's not gonna be the Arduino's low, it's gonna be the big battery's low. So then that means the electricity is gonna flow through it like this and the motor is gonna run in the clockwise direction. Now, what if I want the motor to run in the opposite direction? Well, if I want the motor to run in the opposite direction, I want the, the power to flow in the opposite direction. So that's easy to do. This pin number, oops, uh, hang on. I hate it when I accidentally do that. Let me fix this. Let me, let me go back and restore what I had there before. Okay, so the first time that we did this, we had pin number two was set for high, okay? So what we're gonna do this time is we're gonna, re we're gonna reverse it. We're gonna, we're gonna set pin number two to be low and we're gonna set pin number seven to be high. Remember what I said, what this chip does is he will make number three mirror whatever it sees on the input on number two and it'll make pin number six mirror whatever it sees on pin number seven. So if we make pin number two low, then it's gonna make pin number three be the ground for the big battery. And if it sees pin number seven is high, then it's gonna set pin number six to be high, but it's gonna be the big battery high, not the Arduino high. So what's gonna happen? The electricity is gonna flow in the opposite direction from what it flowed before. That's gonna make the motor spin in the opposite direction from what it flowed before, right? So you'll notice we did everything here using the left side of the battery. We didn't use anything on the right side of the battery. The right side of the battery is a completely separate H bridge. So this chip actually has two H bridges in it, which is really handy because there are gonna be a lot of times when you're gonna have a car that's gonna have two separate motors and you're gonna have a motor for the right side and a motor for the left side, you can run both motors independently using this one chip. All right. Now, in order for the pin to do its job, in order for this chip to do its job, the chip needs power. And so that's where pin number 16 comes in. Pin number 16 needs to be connected to a five volt source. This, this powers the chip, not the motor. So we're gonna connect up five volts to pin 16. If we don't have five, five volts connected to pin 16, nothing's gonna work. Now this pin down here, pin number eight, this is the pin that powers the motor. And this can be anything. This can be, this can be five volts if you want, or it could be nine volts, could be 12 volts, could be six volts, could be pretty much anything as long as, as at least 4.5 volts. If this pin right here has anything less than 4.5 volts, then it gets iffy and it might work and it might not work. Um, but as long as it's 4.5 volts or higher, then this is where the motor is gonna get its power from. Now, pin number one, 
this is a useful pin. This is the pin that I that I called the enable pin. Okay. So here is where it comes in really handy. What you can do is you can, it, let's say you want the motor to run forwards. So you're gonna set pin number two to be high and you're gonna set pin number seven to be low. And so if you do that, then what's gonna happen is that the power is going to flow from pin number six and is gonna go in here and it's, it's gonna come out from pin number three through the motor is going to go into pin number six. And then from there, it's going to go to the ground. And I haven't yet talked about how you get to the ground, but pins four and five, those go to the ground. So pins four and five, they need to be connected to the ground. All right. Now, let's suppose we want to pulse width modulate the motor because we don't want it to run at full speed. We want to run it at 27% speed or 52% speed. Right. We could, in theory, pulse width modulate pin number two. But sometimes it's easier to just turn this on and have it be on solid and turn this guy low and have this guy be low solid. And then what we do is we pulse width modulate the enable pin. We, we, we pulse width modulate pin number one. Okay, so if we send in a bunch of pulses like this into pin number one, the motor will only get energy when pin number one is high. If pin number one is low, it will not get energy. So if we pulse with modulate pin number one, the motor will receive a pulse with modulated sim signal. And we, and we can leave, we can leave uh, pin number two solid high. We don't have to modulate pin number two because sometimes that's convenient, all right? And then the, the pins on the, on the right side, they work basically the same way as what I just described. Pin number nine is the enable pin for the motor on the right. Pin number 10 is the input pin. Pin number 11 is the output, which will mirror whatever it sees on pin, uh, pin 10. Pin number 15 is the input, and then pin number 14 will mirror whatever it sees on pin 15. And then for pins, uh, that's a typo there. That 14 should not be a 14. That 14 should be a 13. This, this is a typo. I definitely am going to have to replace this drawing here. Okay. All right, so hopefully, that makes sense. I realize I hit with you, I hit you with a lot of stuff all at once. But uh, now, if you didn't fully understand that, remember everything that I'm saying is being recorded. But now that you've got a brief introduction, let's go back in here and let's look again at my uh, Tinkercad H bridge, and you can see what I'm doing and why I'm doing it here. Okay, so this pin. It, it's kind of hard to see on the screen here, but right here, that's the little half circle that I told you about. Let me see if I can zoom in on that. Okay. Weird. Why is it doing this? Okay. All right. Can you see the half circle now? Let me turn, make it be yellow here. There's that half circle that I was telling you about right there. Okay, so that tells you that this is pin number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then this is pin number nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. All right, so now if we hover in Tinkercad, if we hover over it, you can see that it tells us that this is the enable for the for for the lower side of the of the motor. This one here is the enable for the upper. This one here is the input, input number one, and this is the output, which will mirror whatever it sees. So if pin number one is is this is the one that's connected to the Arduino. 
So if pin number one is high from the Arduino, pin number three will be high, but not from the Arduino, it'll be high from the big battery. Pin number four is ground. Pin number five is ground. Pin number six is going to mirror whatever it sees on pin number seven. So if pin number seven is high from the Arduino, pin number six will be high from the big battery. If pin number seven is low from the Arduino, then pin number six will also be low, but it'll be low for the big battery. And then pin number eight, this is where, where the big battery gets connected into the plus side. Okay, and then all these guys up here, I'm not using those except pin number 16. I have to use pin number 16 because if the uh, chip doesn't have any power, it's not gonna do its job. All right, so those are the pins there. So let me now erase that and then let me back up a little bit so you can see how I've got it all connected. All right, so you can see that, uh, let's, let's start with pin number 16. Right. So you can see that what I've done is I've got a, a wire from the five volt pin on the Arduino coming up here and going into pin number 16. So pin number 16 will always, always, always have five volts on it. Okay. I can't turn it off if I, I couldn't turn it off if I wanted to. It will always have five volts on it. Let's look at these others here. So this pin right here, this is the enable pin. So I've got to connect it up to pin number 11 on the Arduino. So if I want to run the motor, I need to set pin 11 high. Now, pin number 10, that's the one that goes into pin two here. And so if that is high, then pin three will be high but it'll be high from the big battery, not from the Arduino. So then the electricity will come. So the electricity will come from the big battery, which is which comes in pin number eight, and it'll go through here. It'll come out this side. It'll run down here. It'll go through the motor. It'll come back out this side. And then in order for this to work, it needs to go in there. Now it will only go in there if that pin is set low, which it will if I've got pin number seven from the Arduino set low, because the pin, the pin, this pin right, right, because this pin right here will mirror whatever it sees right there. Okay, I see somebody just typed something in the chat box here. Okay, so Hannah is asking, pin 16 has to have power, but pin one doesn't. Yes, you're correct. So pins, pin 16 always, always, always needs power on it. Pin number one only has power on it if you want the motor to run. And if you want the motor to stop, then just turn, then just set pin number one to be low. And if you want the motor to run at half speed or quarter speed, then what you do is pulse width modulate pin number one. Okay. So you can see that I've got some ground connections here that are important. Okay, let me show this. Okay, so these two pins right here are connected to this rail. And remember, everything on this rail here is all connected together. And this is connected to my ground. Okay, so that means that these guys right here are connected to the ground. This guy right here is connected to the ground. So both of these pins are connected to the ground. And by the way, on this side, on the top side, these guys are also connected to the ground on the top up there. Okay. All right, so can you see, does it make sense how this works? So let me just say it one more time. I, I know that I'm repeating myself, but I also know from experience that if a teacher doesn't repeat himself, then students aren't gonna get it. So if I set this guy to be high, and if I set this guy here to be low, and both of these come from the Arduino, okay? So this pin here mirrors whatever he sees on his neighbor. And so if, if this guy is high, then this guy will be high too, but he won't be high from the Arduino, he'll be high from the big battery. And if this guy here is low, then this guy here will also be low, but again, low from the big battery. 
So that means the electricity can come out here, go over here, go through the big battery and come back in here. And so then the motor will run in the forward direction. Now, if I want the motor to run backwards, what I just do is this pin here, instead of making him high, I make him be low. And this guy right here, instead of making him be low, I make him be high. And then that way, the electricity will flow in the opposite direction. Okay, so hopefully I didn't go through that too fast. So again, I need you guys to type into the chat box. Give me a yes if you think you understand that. Give me a no if you didn't understand that. I need more people typing in stuff here. Okay, good. I'm seeing lots of yeses. All right. So now hopefully you can understand why the motor on the left here does what he does. And if we click on the code, so so let me let me click on this Arduino here. So remember when you got two Arduinos in the same Tinkercad, if you want to, if you click on the code here, you don't necessarily know which, which code you're going to get. So if you click here, okay, so I've clicked on this Arduino. Now when I click on code, the code that I will see will be the code for the Arduino on the left. All right, so let's take a look at what I've done. All right, so hopefully you can see here that what I've done, and let, let me zoom in on this, make it a little bit bigger. Okay, so my code says set pin 11 to low. Okay, so pin 11 is the one that's connected to my enable right there. So I set it low, but only temporarily. Um, what I like to do is I like to make sure that whenever I'm switching the motor forwards or backwards or anything, I like to make sure that, it, that everything's at a full stop before I go turning my motor. So I, if I set pin low, that's, that means that my enable is going to be off. Okay. Then what I do is I'm going to set pins, pin 7 to high. And I'm sorry, I'm going to set pin 10 to high and pin, pin 7 to low. So what this means is this tells the motor that I want to run the motor in the forward direction. But because enable is turned off, the motor is not actually going to run that direction. It's only going to run that direction when I turn the enable back on again. All right, so now what I'm doing here is I'm doing a count thing. So I'm going to start, I'm going to start at, at zero. And, uh, and so I'm going to set pin 11 to whatever I is. So I is the counter. So I start off at zero. So that means I set pin 11 to, to zero and I wait for one second. So th what that means is that the, the uh, pin 11 is not going to be on. So my pulse width modulation has got a zero duty cycle. So for one second, the motor is going to be off. Then my loop here says come back up to the top. But now we're going to take I, which used to be 0, and we're going to add 50 to it. So I is now going to be 50. So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to set pin 11 to I, which is, which is now 50. So what that means is I'm going to pulse width modulate. And my pulse widths are going to look like this, right? So that means my motor is going to be running at approximately 20% speed. And it's going to run at 20% speed for about one second. And then it's going to come up here again. And then now it's going to add another 50. So I is now going to be 100. And so I'm going to set pin 11 to that. So now my pulses are a little bit wider. So now I'm running at a, what's called a 40% duty cycle. And then when I go through again, then I be, goes to 150. So that takes, that'll take me up to where I'm at about a 60% duty cycle. And so I just keep on going up and up and up in speed. Okay. And then once I finally get up to 250, now I'm running at basically full speed. Now, actually, full speed is really 255. 
but I'm not going to worry about the difference. I, I like nice round numbers. So, so even though 255 isn't technically 100% full speed, uh, it's close enough for my purposes. All right. So once I've done that, now what I do is I set pin number 11 back to zero again. So I set the enable down to low. So I stop the motor completely. And look at what I'm doing now. I'm swapping these guys. So pin, pin 10 used to be high. Now I'm going to make it low. Pin 7 used to be low. Now I'm going to make it high. So that means that once I turn pin 11 back on again, the motor is now going to run in reverse. Okay, But it's, it's not going to do that until I turn pin 11 back on. But when I do turn pin 11 back on, it'll run in reverse. And then you can see that what I've done here is just the exact same thing that I did before, except notice, OK, th this time uh, the motor is running in reverse. But uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to start off at 20%. Well, it's, it's going to start off at 0. And then it'll go to 20% speed. And then it'll go to 40% speed, and so forth and so on. So this is how it works. So hopefully you guys agree that the code here is actually pretty simple. And so if we start the simulation, you can see exactly what's happening. So give it a second. OK, then so we are at 0 for one second. Now we're at 20% speed. Now we're at 40% speed. Now we're at 60% speed. Now we're at 80% speed. Now the, the clock is running a little bit slow. Uh, Tinkercad does it. Okay, so now we're at full speed in forward. Okay, now what's going to happen is it's going to come to a stop. And now it's going to go in reverse. Now, now this pulse, remember, this is a negative pulse here. This, this is a little bit confusing to newbies. This right here is zero volts. So what we have is a negative pulse. And that negative pulse gets wider and wider and wider. It, okay, so just remember, this is an upside down pulse. This is not, when, in fact, well, just you guys understand, right? It's a negative pulse. So what you're seeing right now is full speed. Okay, so now the motor stopped and now we're back to going forward again at 20% speed. All right, so does that make sense? You guys understand what's happening now and why it's happening that way? All right, so you should be able to now build your circuit. And remember, I don't want you to build a Tinkercad circuit. I want you to build a real circuit. Now, I do need to explain one thing. Some of you are going to have a little bit of a problem because when I put your kits together, I didn't have a whole bunch of these. What I, what I wanted was one of these guys. This is a battery holder that can hold three AA batteries. Okay, so you put it in right here. Okay, so I got three AA batteries, and then I just connect up the red and the black wires. And this is what the motor likes the, the most, these yellow motors. They, they, they work best if you run them at about four and a half volts. Now, it is possible to run them as low as three volts. And it is possible to go as high as six volts, but you don't want to go. You don't want to exceed that. And even at three volts, it'll run, but it doesn't run as happily as it does at four and a half volts. So, when I put your kit of parts together, I didn't have enough of these to give everybody a three battery holder. Some of you have this guy right here. He can only hold two AA batteries. Now. If you run this guy with the, with the mechanical relay, it runs just fine. But if you try to run this as the quote unquote big battery for your solid state H bridge, it, it's, on the, it's on the edge of what the, what the spec, and actually it's below spec. The, the H bridge, if you look at the spec sheet, it says that whenever you connect a big battery to it, that big battery should be four and a half volts or higher. And so, 
don't be surprised if you try using this as the big battery on your H bridge and it doesn't really work right. Okay. So, so the, the best thing to do is to get one of these. So what I did over the weekend is I bought a bunch more of these and I took them into the Ames office and I gave them to Nancy in the Ames office. So if you go into the Ames office and ask her for one of these, she will give you one. Now, if you are clever, it is possible to do it with one of these, okay? So what you can do, here, let me, uh, let me get my batteries out of my triple holder here. Okay. What you can do is take this guy and put, the, put your batteries inside him. Okay. And then somehow connect in another guy here. Now, what you need to do is make sure you connect the red wire to the negative side of this battery. So just find some way to connect that up. And now I now have a four and a half volt battery pack where one of the batteries is outside of it. So if I connect this now to, to my uh, solid state H bridge and connect this to ground, then it will work, but it is gonna be extremely awkward. So and the best thing to do is get one of these triple things from Nancy. Now, Okay. Um, all right. So I think you guys are good to go now. Uh, you do not have a homework assignment that's due on Thursday. Uh, but I do want you to have worked on your circuits so that when Thursday comes around and we meet, if you've had any problems, we can talk about the problems. And hopefully we can find solutions to your problems. So this, this circuit, these two circuits that you guys are building, they're due on Saturday, but please don't wait until the last day to do them. Start them now so that that way when we meet again on Thursday, if you have any problems, we can deal with your problems. Okay, so I'm thinking we're good to go. If you guys don't have any questions, you can go ahead and type buy into the chat box and head out. If you do have questions, but you didn't want to ask because you knew this class was being recorded, what I'll do is I'll stop the recording and then we can talk in private.